So for people that don't have that type of discipline, how can they be consistent on the nutritional intake over a lifetime and make it their lifestyle and not just a diet? Yeah, I mean, it's such a basic, good question that people always want to bring it back to like tracking and things like that. And mm. I think that that doesn't, that, that works, tracking works, but you're talking about it at a deeper level, right? Yes. Because I, I experience the same thing. I can have the most steadfast meditator monk that I'm talking to, and they will still <laughs> battle with this, right? Really? And it's some to the point where we have so much things, so many things that are just available at our fingertips that are just... Temptations. In not, not in alignment with how we've continued to evolve as, uh, oh. you know, it's like we just... Technology and food production and the food industry is growing at an exponentially faster rate than how we are changing, right? So we have these things that are available that just simply shouldn't, and outside of putting yourself in a, in a locker and like away from these foods, a total echo chamber, like you are fighting temptation all the time. And we have to recognize that there's only so much power in your prefrontal cortex. There's yeah. only so much, so much willpower, willpower right? yeah. Like it's a finite resource. So with that, you have to kind of change your way of thinking. And the way that like this occurred to me like three years ago or so, when I had, I had a really, really bad like sinus infection. And I've always had some kind of recurring sinus infections ever since I was little, but I had one that was really bad and I couldn't taste or smell for like two months, wow. right? And that was something where I realized like, why am I still craving these certain foods? I can't even taste them, right? And it was like this aha moment where I'm like, this is clearly a mental thing because something sweet hits your taste buds. It's not just the taste of it, it's what it's doing in the brain. So changing your relationship with food, changing your relationship with struggle has been a very big thing, right? So. For me, I always had this kinesthetic awareness thing with my workouts, right? With workouts, it was like, if I inflicted pain upon myself and it was positive pain for a workout, I could flip this kinesthetic switch that was like, I called it my pain switch and I would flip that pain switch and you know, as, a, as a, an athlete, mm -hmm. like, that's sometimes just what you do and it happens inadvertently. Sometimes you visualize it, but visualization is huge. So for me, I'd visualize flipping the pain switch. If the switch is off, I can now push it harder and push it past my normal aerobic capacity, anaerobic, whatever. I realized, why can't I apply that same thing to nutrition without becoming robotic, but becoming very, very aware. And so I've changed my mm. relationship with how food makes me feel. So like, and that's taken a lot of work. So what do you say to yourself? What, what's the conversation, the inner dialogue, the, the mental strategy you use yeah. to do that? As simple as it sounds, whenever I would eat something for about two or three months, I would simply say like, food is fuel. Food is fuel. And that sounds very... Because you don't want to take the fun out of it. I still yeah. love food, right? So with when you do that, but you have to train yourself to believe that, like, okay, if I'm eating this sugar, that's okay. But remember, it's fuel, and I should use it, right? Or if I'm, and that's the thing here. So if I want to eat it, make sure I move my body, go for a ten minute walk, walk up exactly, some stairs, move it a little bit, just get it out. When you change the relationship with food, mm. you're not abstaining. You're you're changing the reaction, right? Mm -hmm. So like. And okay. I should never have a, uh, a bucket of ice cream and then just sit around. Well, that's, it's just the thing, right? <laughs> it's like, it's if like, you're going to do it. Eat it in the morning. Eat it for breakfast, whatever. Right. <laughs> right. Like, and then go move all day. It, exactly. It's, so that relationship, I mean, it gets much bigger than that, right? But that relationship with food is everything. And so many of us have a distorted relationship with food. And for me being, I've been on opposite ends of sort of the, the spectrum, right? Like when I was younger, I was practically, you know, as a runner, I was practically eating disorder category the other direction like I have to be as light as possible oh I don't want to eat that I don't want to get fat I don't want to and then it kind of went the other way where it was almost like masochistic where I'm just like I don't care I'm fat already let's just go all go the way all, yeah, yeah. okay now it's kind of like fine a little bit of that middle ground but the pendulum is probably swings much more towards how I was when I was younger got to stay lean got to stay this but I also have recognized that like food food is still reward and we are constantly told that food shouldn't be treated as a reward don't reward your kids with food I call on that the reason is is because like food has always been a reward right it's always been a reward for you us. get the hunt and you yeah. get the food yeah you go <laughs> gather and you get some food yeah it's simple right it, it's what you have to do is you just have to once again change the relationship with the feelings attached to food recognize that those feelings are there but do something with them rather than just let them let them be and consume you mm. if i am going to go and eat that ice cream then i'm aware of what that's doing in my body and 
I'm not going to let that turn me the other direction and get depressed and go eat more. I'm going to say, you know what? This is an opportunity, an opportunity to move more, an opportunity to move tomorrow. And that's not having this transactional relationship again, because what you don't want to do is say, I'm going to eat some pie and now I'm going to punish myself by going on the treadmill. That's the exact Mm. wrong thing to do, right? But you do say, okay, I'm going to eat this pie great, I've got full glycogen tanks, I'm going to go work out. I'm going to get the best workout of my life. I'm going to have some fun with this. Before the interview continues, if you feel like you're not living your most authentic life, not leaning into your purpose, and not living the life that your future self would be extremely proud of, I've written a new book called The Greatness Mindset, and I think you're going to love this. Through powerful stories, science-backed strategies, and step-by-step guidance, The Greatness Mindset will help you overcome all the different challenges in your life to design the life of your dreams and then turn it into your reality. Make sure to click the link below in the description to get your copy today. Okay, let's get back to this video. And I teach my kids the same thing. And having kids has really made this apparent Mm. because kids are constantly, I want a snack, I want a snack. It's like they have five stomachs. I don't understand it. (laughs) But, and like, how do you, like if they're reaching for like a Lara bar or something that I would still consider healthy but has a decent amount of sugar from dates and stuff, right? Like they, kids just crave these things. And, how do I teach them that you, yeah, you can eat that, but we should really get out and move, right. you know? And you know, it's kind of like how I translate it to them is, hey, it's fun to feel good. It's fun to feel good, right? Like you've got this energy from that bar. Doesn't that feel good? Like let's, let's get out and let's use that energy. Let's go have fun. And now it's to the point where my kids are like, can I have a lar bar? I want to go outside and play. That's I'm like, this is awesome. Like That's cool. without actually like molding them in any right. weird way, I've helped them like light a spark to understand that like when they eat this and at a young subconscious level in their brain, it's probably forming something that's beyond what we even know in research where maybe they taste something sweet and now they naturally want to move versus saying like, oh, shame, guilt, I shouldn't have eaten this, it's terrible. No, we're going to go have fun, we're going to play. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I teach them that with not just sugar, I teach them that with, with fats too because I think it's also fundamental to learn that all food is fuel, Yes. but be in touch with how it makes you feel. So how I retain that discipline is the exact same way. It's like, how do I feel? What, did, what do I feel after I eat this? Did I feel crappy? Okay, well then that's probably a pretty good articulation of what that's doing in my body. And with that, it's, it's really turned into this intuitive eating. And that's like, I guess, the, I mean, it's a great segue to talk about how fasting has worked, right? Because fasting has allowed me to have more flexibility with my diet in the confines of still like appropriate discipline uh, because I can flip that switch on and off a lot yes. easier. Fasting, not fasting, fasting, not fasting. So. And you're one of the, there's a few things I want to talk about here before I get into fasting. Uh, one is the, the mantra, it sounds like you had, the mental switch, the mantra of food is fuel. Yeah. So is that something you would think about right before you were making a decision of what to eat? No, to see usually, something usually or, while eating it. While eating it. So it wasn't helping you make a decision of like, okay, here's a candy bar. Am I going to decide this is, is this going to help me and fuel me in a positive way or a negative yeah. fuel? That's too willpower-y. That's okay. too, like, that takes too much energy. So you would still eat the candy bar if you needed, or if you did. While I, while, well, yes. And granted, this was happening three, three and a half years ago, so candy bars weren't really in the equation anymore. Mm, right. But that being because said. Because of from, an apple or whatever. Okay, something. Yeah, or something, like, because I <laughs> would still crave fruit or, yes. you know, whatever. But yes, exactly. It's like while I'm consuming it, it's like really trying to teach my body and understand, like, this visualization. You know the power of visualization, mm-hmm. obviously, just yourself and the guests you've had on. It's like that visualization with eating something can be just as powerful. So you would say this as you're having a bite of the apple or, or whatever it might be, you'd be having an internal conversation, food is fuel, and then having a positive relationship with something that might be looked at as negative before. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Precisely, yep. And training your body to appreciate the food and to say, okay, I'm going to go act and move my body after I eat this and it's going to help me, it's not going to hurt me, and I don't need to be shameful about eating this. Is that kind of the, yes. the process? Yep. Because a lot of people that eat something and they... They feel good because it tastes good, but then they feel shameful. Yes. And that doesn't help them because then they have more of that to have the good feeling and then feel shame again. And the cycle continues. Because what is happening here is much different than what's happening here. Yeah. And, you know, in our world, like we get this instant gratification from food, especially like the translation of, I see a direct correlation with my time 
Scrolling social media and my addiction to my phone, direct line item correlation to how much I crave snacking and things like that. It's the same firing, you know, right? It's like that same dopamine itch that needs to be scratched. Yes. And just in the same way I get addicted to looking at my phone or checking my email, that usually correlates with how much my addiction to food is at that point in time. But like, you don't just say like, I am going to like resist the urge to check yeah. my email. I'm going to resist the urge to check my email. Sometimes it takes like, what is the response? Like a lot of times, you know, you'll, you'll check your email first thing in the morning, you'll get a negative email and you, it hits you then. You're like, this is how I'm starting my day. Oh, like, yeah. this is what I'm going to do. Like, screw that. And that's your catalyst. But like with food, you eat a Snickers bar and it feels so good up here. You feel like you're doing the it's right amazing. thing. amazing. Yeah, yeah. Every, uh, everything is telling you in that immediate moment that this was a good decision, Lewis. <laughs> like you did the right thing. And your belly afterwards is like, oh, why yep. is it digesting weird? And now I feel like lethargic. And yeah. And you go out and you move and you try to do something with it. And yeah, you're going to have some fuel, but you're going to be like, you know what? It's crazy enough. That didn't feel as good as when I had that apple. And exactly. you start creating this internal checks and balances, if you want to call it that. And that's the one thing is like across the board, whether you're a low carb advocate, whether you're a calories in, calories out person, whether you're an intermittent, it doesn't matter what category you're in. You can be vegan, it doesn't matter. Trans fats, they, I haven't seen any way around it where you could position those as good. Okay, and when you start looking at what that does as far as an inflammatory response